Matthew chapter 5 and verse 1 to 12. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Amen. Jesus, the long-awaited King, has come. And that was our main focus last week. If you remember, we we read this quote from Paul Tripp. The baby in the manger came to be king, and he would not settle for anything else. That infant was the king of kings and the lord of lords. He would grow to be a man, a perfect man. He would talk again and again about the kingdom he came to establish. But he would do much, much more than just talk. The king would die as a criminal so that criminals against his rule would be welcomed into his throne room and live with all the rights and privileges of being a member of his royal family. As an introduction to the Sermon on the Mount, which is our new sermon series, last week we looked at the first four chapters of Matthew. And we looked at how, uh, in particular, how the Gospel of Matthew, time and time again, focuses on Jesus as being king, the long-awaited king, the long-promised king. You see, Jesus came to be king. And in coming to be king, Jesus really came to rescue us from our own kingdoms, from the kingdom of darkness, from the kingdom of sin and death. He came to rescue us from that kingdom and to bring us into his glorious, everlasting kingdom of light. He came to bring us into a better kingdom. And he does that through the cross. By dying and rising again, when we put our faith and trust in him, we move from the kingdom of sin, death, and darkness. We move from the place of our own little kingdoms, us trying to be king, and we move into the place of his kingdom under the better rule of a better king. In essence, we become members of his royal family. That's what happens when we choose to put our faith in Jesus. Now, the full extent, in some ways, of that kingdom that we've now become a part of has yet to be fully realized. In essence, as believers, we, are, we have become part of this kingdom, part of the royal family, and now we are awaiting the fulfillment of this kingdom. We're waiting for the return of the king where he will finally put everything to right and he will bring us face to face with him in his kingdom, face to face with the king. But until that point, until that moment, in essence, what we do right now is we live as ambassadors and as citizens of this new eternal kingdom in a foreign land. And so in many ways, what the Sermon on the Mount is really teaching us is is what it looks like to be citizens of God's kingdom. 
And it's as we live out as citizens, as God's kingdom, in some ways, it's glimpses of God's kingdom coming to earth. When we, as the body of Christ, as individuals and, and corporately, as we begin to live out kingdom culture, as we begin to live out principles of his kingdom, we're getting a glimpse of the kingdom to come. And so my encouragement to us is this, as we go through, uh, over these coming months, as we go through the Sermon on the Mount, this is our King calling us to live as citizens of his kingdom. And this is what it looks like to be a citizen. And so it begins in verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain, and when he was seated, his disciples came to him. And then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Being citizens of God's kingdom is about being a disciple. The opening two verses really set the scene. The, the previous chapter, what we see, we see Jesus has begun his public ministry. We see Jesus in chapter 3 being baptized by John, by the Father, publicly saying, This is my son. We then see Jesus tempted in the wilderness by Satan, but he overcomes. He's victorious. And then Jesus begins teaching. He begins doing miracles. He begins calling people to follow him. And multitudes, they're gathering. They're coming from all over the place to see this Jesus. And so Jesus, seeing the multitudes, he goes up to the mountain. And notice that Matthew highlights a particular group among the multitude. Who does he highlight? He says, his disciples came to him. Now, what does it mean to be a disciple? When we think of disciple, our minds often think of the 12 disciples. But, but Jesus had other disciples other than the 12. You see, basically, to be a disciple, and, and the Greek word for disciple there, basically can be translated as learner or as a pupil. In essence, to be a disciple of Jesus is to be a student. Being a Christian is about being a student, a pupil of Jesus. Now, how often do you think about your relationship with Jesus in that light? Of you being a disciple and he being the rabbi, the teacher. Of you being a student coming under your professor. I remember when I was at university and I, I studied music and part of my course was having one-to-one -one drum lessons. And I was quite fortunate in my first year and, and the preceding years, uh, I, I just got randomly allocated what was regarded as the best drum teacher in the college. And I like, praise the Lord. I didn't, even, I didn't even know I had a choice in the matter, but thank you for leading me to this particular teacher. And as his student and other students as well, we were eager to listen to him, to listen to his instruction. But we also wanted to emulate the way he played, the way he performed. So we'd be going to his gigs and his concerts and we see the way he's tinkering at the cymbals and he's touching the drums and we're like, wow, that's awesome. We're even looking at his gear. Okay, what cymbals does he use? We even went out and bought the same sticks as him. It's like, okay, yeah, we've got to get the same sticks. We wanna, because we were like, hey, this guy, we want to learn from him. We want to emulate him. This guy is, is a teacher and we want to be his students. In some ways, in musical terms, we became his disciples. Now, how much more should it be so when it comes to Jesus, who teaches us far deeper things, far more important things than learning a musical instrument? You see, to be a Christian is to be a disciple of Jesus. As we see in the Great Commission at the end of Matthew's Gospel, what is Jesus' parting words to his disciples before he ascends into heaven? He says that, go therefore and make what? Disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. We are to be disciples who in turn make disciples. And part of being a disciple of Jesus is listening and obeying his teaching. 
back in our text, as the disciples come, what does Jesus do? Opened his mouth and he taught them. You see, Matthew is highlighting this dynamic between Jesus being the student, the teacher, and his disciples. Sorry, Jesus being the teacher and his students being the disciples, eager to listen as he lays before them what it looks like to follow him. And my prayer is, and encouragement to you is, maybe it's, it's a good chance for us to step back and, and think to ourselves, okay, I'm called to be a disciple of Jesus. How am I growing as a disciple? How am, how am I growing as his student? Am I being a disciple and seeking to make other disciples? Am I willing to sit and to humbly learn at the feet of Jesus? Because if, if, if I'm willing to do that, oh, there is blessing to be had. Verse 2, then he opened his mouth and he taught them saying, blessed are. Dot, dot, dot. We'll look at what he says in a second. Um, in my dad's side of the family, my dad, uh, dad's side of the family originate from Jamaica. And we, I found that at weddings and at other celebrations, there's this song that always comes up. Always time and time again, it brings everybody to the dance floor. And the song is, I am blessed, I am blessed. Every day of my life, I am blessed. When I wake up in the morning and I lay my head to rest, Every day of my life, I am blessed. And always at my dad's gatherings and parties and stuff, everybody gets up and you're all dancing and singing. Yes, I am blessed, I am blessed. Every day of my life, I am blessed. It's always a great moment. But a good question to ask ourselves is, what does it mean to be blessed? It's one of those kind of maybe Christian terms, you could call jargon, that we often use and throw out. If I were to look at my WhatsApp messages and to count the amount of times I say blessed, I'd be, I'd be, uh, I'd be... I'll be pleasantly shocked. But here we see Jesus using that word nine times in these opening verses. It's a word that we use in Christian circles, even outside of Christian circles. We use this term blessed. But the question is, well, what, what does it actually mean? What does it mean to be blessed? The Greek word used here, it means supremely blessed or by extension, fortunate, well off happy. Webster's Dictionary describes blessed as enjoying happiness, bringing pleasure, contentment, or good fortune. To be blessed, it speaks of, of goodness. It speaks of, of joy. And the question we would ask ourselves, well, who, well, who wouldn't want to be blessed? And yet Jesus' vision of what it means to be blessed is very different to what we naturally think of. Now, this is going to be a hard exercise to do, but, but at least try. Imagine for a second that you've not read what Jesus has just said, what we've just read, and maybe you've come across it before. But imagine you don't know what Jesus is about to say about the blessed life. And if somebody was to ask you the question, fill in the blank, blessed are, if you had no reference to what Jesus has been teaching, what would you, in all honesty, write down? Now, don't shut it out, but just in your minds, think, in all honesty, if you were like, yes, that's the blessed life, or blessed are the dot, 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 what would you fill in the blank? Would you say, blessed are the wealthy? Blessed are the financially secure? That's the blessed life. Or maybe you say, blessed is... The married. Blessed is the one who's found a spouse, a life partner. Or maybe you would say, blessed are the beautiful, those who are externally beautiful. Or maybe you would say, blessed are the healthy, a blessed life. That's what it looks like, to be physically healthy. Blessed are the popular. Man, that person over there, that popular person, they're really blessed. Blessed are the talented or gifted. Blessed are the one with the dream job. Blessed is the one who never goes through hardship, pain, or sorrow. How many of us, if we were truly honest, 
would be thinking about some of those things to fill in the gap with. Or maybe there's other things we'd also put in there. And yet when we come to Jesus' list, it's very different. Alistair, a uh, pastor in the States, he says this, Alistair Begg, he says this, the word we translate blessed, it means how happy, how fortunate, or how privileged. And we all know people whom we look at and just think, your life is great. It's all fallen into place for you. You must be so happy. You are so fortunate. You are so privileged. And you're probably picturing someone right now. Those we consider blessed tend to be wealthy or the successful or the powerful or the popular. And Jesus looks at his disciples, his followers, and he says that even though they are none of those things, it is they who are blessed. Why? Simply because they are members of his kingdom. The truly blessed person with the truly blessed life is not the one whose life is full of material possessions or romantic love or ease and comfort or popularity or power or success. No, that's not the blessed person. You could have none of those things, but if you have Jesus and if you have his kingdom, that is what true blessing looks like. And the means by which we enter that kingdom is really summed up in the very first blessing. Verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. What does it mean to be poor in spirit? The Greek word used there um, comes from another Greek word, which is to crouch. So this particular word for poor can be translated as uh, a beggar. Uh, somebody um, literally or figuratively is, is, is distressed, is, is begging, is in poverty. So this is kind of the image kind of being created. Imagine somebody who is in poverty who, who is begging. Now, an, an aspect of begging, um, and, and especially, especially back then, especially when there wasn't so much in the way of sort of social or social care, but in the sense of, as Jesus' disciples would have been seeing people begging, there is this understanding of, I have a need. I need help. When we see blessed are the poor in spirit, the way in which I would explain it is this. It is basically somebody who is low in spirit. It's basically somebody who realizes their need for Jesus. There is a lowering of oneself it is somebody really understanding and seeing their true spiritual condition before God and their need for him. And we kind of see this thread throughout other places in Scripture. Let me give you a few other passages which kind of flesh it out a bit more for us. Verse 17, the sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart. These, O oh God, you will not despise. David writing that famous psalm. He's saying, look, what, what's, what's, what, what, is, what is the real offering that God is after? It's a broken spirit. Someone who is lowly in spirit, poor in spirit, somebody who realizes their need and their heart is contrite, it's broken. God's not going to despise that. The prophet Isaiah we read this in Isaiah 66. This is uh, of, of God. For, for all those things my hand has made and all those things exist, says the Lord. So this is God speaking. But on this one will I look on him who is poor and of a contrite spirit and who trembles at my words. So here's God speaking. And he says that, that the one I'm going to be looking at is not the one who's kind of elevating himself in pride and pomp. Notice I'm going to be looking upon the one who is honest about their need for me and their spiritual condition. And they're trembling at my words. 
So, uh, Proverbs 16, 18 to 12. Pride goes before destruction and a haunty spirit before a fall. Better to be of a humble spirit with the lowly than to divide the spoil with the pride. See, there's this contrast here between those who are prideful in spirit, haunty in spirit, and those who are humble in spirit, or we could say poor in spirit. To be haunty in spirit is, is, is that a heart of pride. And pride says, God, I don't need you. I've got it all sorted. God, I'm good. I'm good. I don't need you. I don't have a need for you. I'm all sorted. I can do life on my own. That's the prideful spirit, but the humble spirit is the one who says, no, God, I need you. And as the, the author of Paul says, hey, prideful spirit, the prideful heart is going to lead to destruction. But the humble spirit, oh, it's going to lead to life. And it's better to be humble spirit with the lowly rather than to divide the spoil with the pride. And then this last one, Psalm 34, verse 18. The Lord is near to those who have a, a broken heart and save such as have a contrite spirit. I hope you're kind of getting the idea of what this poor in spirit means and looks like. And let me give you an actual example from Scripture which really perfectly illustrates what it means to be poor in spirit. And it's when we look at the thief on the cross. Let me read to you Luke chapter 23. When Jesus is being crucified on the cross, he's between two criminals. Now, when we put all the different gospel accounts together, we read that at, to begin with, because crucifixion took several hours, to begin with, both criminals are insulting Jesus. They're blaspheming Jesus, they're cursing Jesus. But at some point during the crucifixion, one of the criminals has this change of heart, this change of mind. And what he does is, he, well, he says this. So this one criminal rebukes the other criminal. And he says, do you not even fear God? Seeing you are under the same condemnation, this is Luke 23, 39, but we indeed justly, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And then he said to Jesus, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. The thief on the cross is the perfect example of somebody who was poor in spirit. Because he turns to Jesus and he says, Hey Jesus, I recognize my guilt. I recognize my sin. And I recognize my need. Please God, Jesus, remember me when you come into what? Into your kingdom. So there is... And, and that, that really is like, sometimes I think we forget how much faith is in that statement. Because in that moment, the thief is saying, look, even though, Jesus, you're like hanging naked, dying on a cross, I see you as a king of a better kingdom, which exceeds this physical world. There, there's, a, there's a huge amount of faith in this guy's statement. He's like, look, I'm broken, I'm sinful, I'm guilty, but you're innocent Jesus, and you have a kingdom, and so Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And what does Jesus say? Today, you will be with me in paradise. Blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You see, the means by which we enter the kingdom of God is like that thief on the cross, we must become poor in spirit and acknowledge our need before God and say, God, I'm a sinner. God, I need you. God, please forgive me and bring me into your kingdom. 
That is how we come into the kingdom of God. So church, blessed is the poor in spirit. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. So blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom. Blessed is those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Now maybe you're looking at that, and maybe you're thinking this. Blessed are those who, who mourn, who grieve, who, who bewail, is one translation. Like, and you can maybe think to yourself, how can blessing and mourning go together? Because what we really half expect, we, part of us, if we're honest, we're like, Are you sure that's not like a typo? Surely, Jesus, you mean blessed are those who don't mourn. Blessed are those who don't experience sorrow or grief. Because we often think it is, is those who do not experience sorrow, well, they're the blessed people. I'm experiencing sorrow, I'm grieving, I'm not blessed, but they're not experiencing sorrow. They must be blessed. And, and the hard truth is, this isn't a typo. Jesus is teaching something which really goes against our, our, our longing, and even the grain of our culture, to a certain degree, this, this longing of ease and this longing of comfort in this world. So the question we can ask is, well, how, how can somebody who mourns be blessed? How can somebody who grieves be blessed? And now I'm going to uh, lay before you kind of four ways in which I perceive somebody who mourns can be blessed. Um, what I would say is I, I personally think Jesus is referring to the first of these, which I'll explain in a second, but I think the other three would apply as well. In what way could somebody be blessed by mourning and then, then being comforted? Number one is this. When somebody, somebody's mourning of sin leads to salvation. Now, I'm, I'm almost, I'm quite, personally, I'm quite confident that this is what Jesus is mainly referring to. Is this. There is, when somebody mourns their sin, has grief over their sin, that can lead to salvation and the comfort of the gospel. And in that way, somebody is blessed through mourning. Uh, we see this uh, perhaps most notably in 2 Corinthians. So 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 10. Paul writing to the church in Corinth. And he was writing a, 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 a letter because there, there was sin within the church. And, and he was causing them grief. But he was rejoicing because... In the causing of grief, it led to repentance. So 2 Corinthians 7 verse 10, For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. So Paul says that there's two kinds of sorrow. There's a godly sorrow which leads somebody to repent, which leads to salvation, not to be regretted. In essence, there is a mourning when we're actually sorrowful about our sin. Now, a worldly sorrow gets sorry about sin because they get caught or because of the consequences, right? Sometimes it happens in the public eye, right? Somebody does something wrong, which sometimes happened years ago. But what happens? It then suddenly comes to light. They get caught. And then suddenly they have to give a statement of, okay, I'm sorry I did X, Y, and Z. But true godly mourning is actually irrespective if you got caught, irrespective of the initial circumstances or uh, the repercussions of your actions, true godly sorrow is, man, God, what I've done is ultimately wrong against you. And God, I'm grieved by this. I'm sorrowful about this. I'm mourning this. God, why, why am I doing this? That kind of mourning leads to blessing. Why? Because if that's our heart before God, God then comes and says, thank you for acknowledging your sin. Let me point you to the cross. 
Thank you for acknowledging your sin. Now experience my comfort, which is because you have come to me in faith and confessed your sin, there's forgiveness. You see, as we mourn our sin as believers, there should be a comfort afterwards. If we're, if we're kind of just mourning our sin and not embracing the comfort that there's something kind of amiss, we're, 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 we're not actually seeing the gospel and responding to the gospel as we should, but there should be this, this mourning of sin. Oh, but then we turn to the comfort of the gospel. The famous hymn, John Newton, Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. So I did, wow, I'm a wretch of a sinner. There's this mourning, there's this, wow, this sin is horrible. And yet, there's this turning to this amazing grace and experiencing this comfort of, in Jesus Christ, I'm forgiven. So in that way, blessed are those who mourn. If you're mourning your sin in a godly way, blessed are you. Why? Because the comfort of the gospel is there. Because Jesus' death and resurrection forgives you and cleanses you and gives you new life. So that's number one. I'm going to rattle through the next three much quicker than that. But let's say Jesus isn't referring to that. Let me give you a few other things that Jesus could be referring to. Number two, how can blessing come through mourning? Well, as God comforts us, we experience God in a fresh and deeper ways. Uh, David We've been going through David on our Tuesday Bible study. And in one of his Psalms, he says, I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. My God, my strength in whom I trust. My shield and the horn of my salvation. My stronghold. That's Psalms 18. A beautiful way that David begins his Psalm. Now, if David never went through any sort of grieving or difficulty or circumstances, he could potentially say all those titles of God and they would still be true, but they would not have that deep impact upon his heart compared to him having to go through difficulty, go through pain, because then he could actually personally say, well, yes, I know God is a strength. I've experienced it. I know God is a, a rock, not just intellectually, but because I've personally experienced it. I know he's a fortress because I've experienced it. I know he's a deliverer because I went through times of grief and mourning. I know he's my strength and I will trust him. I know he's a shield and a horn of my salvation because, oh, I've been through difficulty. I've been through pain. I've been through sorrow. In some ways, when we go through pain, in some ways, we can experience God in a way as he comforts us that we would not have experienced of God if we just lived in ease and comfort. So there's one way we can be blessed. Another way is this, is that as God comforts us, we can comfort others. Second Corinthians 1, verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, why? That we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort which, with which we ourselves are comforted by God. In essence, what, what, what Paul says to the Corinthians, like, look, the God of all comfort, as he has comforted me, now that enables me to comfort others. And that is a blessing that comes from when we go through moments of mourning and grief, is that as God comforts us, we can then be used as a tool and a means to comfort one another. So that's the third one. And then number four, we have an ultimate comfort to come. When the disciple of Jesus mourns, they mourn with this expectant hope that mourning will turn to rejoicing. Revelation 21 verse 4. At the marriage supper, when the lamb and uh, when we see the bride reunited, when the church is reunited with Christ, what do we read? And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed 
away. Blessed are you who mourn. How can I be blessed? Because if you're a disciple of Jesus, the comfort's coming. Everlasting comfort. And yes, God comforts us now at times. Yes, there's a comfort that he gives to us now. But do not miss the ultimate comfort to come, where every tear is wiped away. There is no more death. There is no more sorrow. There is no more pain. There is no more grief. That's the hope we have as we mourn together. So what we're going to do, in, instead of rushing through the other, uh, kind of what we know as Beatitudes, let's just leave it there for a second. That's kind of set us up for our understanding that we are disciples, and that he is a teacher, and that the blessed life that he lays before us is actually far different than what we often see as blessing or being blessed. And the first two things we want us to remember is this, is that blessed are the poor in spirit. Why? For they shall inherit the kingdom of heaven. So church, disciples, humble yourself within your spirit. Be lowly in spirit, acknowledging your need for Jesus. Second thing is this, blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. As disciples of Jesus, mourn your sin. Be sad about it. But then turn your eyes to the gospel. Because in the gospel, there is comfort. And if you are experiencing mourning, which has nothing to do with your sin, but just the circumstances of life, there is grief, there is mourning. Well, be comforted. Turn to God because there's a comfort to be had now. Turn to God because as he comforts you, he can position you to comfort others. And turn to God because there's an ultimate comfort to come. Because guess what? If you're a disciple of Jesus, if you're a follower of Jesus, you're part of his kingdom, his everlasting kingdom, where you're going to see him face to face, he's going to wipe away every tear. Being a follower of Jesus, we're not promised that there won't be mourning, we're not promised that we won't be grief, but what is promised is there's comfort. There's comfort in the comforter now, and there's comfort in the comforter to come. Uh, the word for comfort used here um, is uh, a word, um, a Greek word, uh, power kaleho, a word we often come across in the various different places. It means to call near. It means to invite or to invoke, to comfort, to exalt, to entreat. That's what God does for us. As his followers, as his disciples, as we mourn, he comes and he calls near. He draws near and provides comfort. My challenge for you this week, see if you can memorize these verses. A little challenge for you. Maybe take a couple a day. See if you can memorize what is known as the Beatitude. So from verse 3 up until verse 12. See if you can memorize these different blesseds are. And I won't test you next week, don't worry. But just for your own thing. And then throughout this week, as you're memorizing it, just keep bringing that to mind. Okay, what does it mean? What does it mean to be blessed? Okay, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are those, see, I even I have to, I have to, uh, I was doing well this week, I thought I was anyway. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure of heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. And blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And in verse 11 and verse 12, which I definitely can't do. But that's my encouragement to you this week. Memorize that. Meditate upon those things. This is what the blessed life looks like. This is what it means to be a disciple, follower of Jesus. Uh, let us pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. 
And Lord, although we've, we've only just scratched the surface, and, and to be honest, we could spend literally weeks and weeks and weeks on just these verses. Because Lord, you, you lay before us what true blessedness looks like. And Lord, we, we so often have such a faulty view of blessedness and what it means to be blessed. And I just pray that as we go through your word, as we meditate on these verses this week, that you would reveal to us, no, this is what it really means to be blessed. This is what it really looks like. And first and foremost, it looks like being a part of your kingdom by being lowly and poor in spirit. And so, Lord, as disciples of Jesus, first of all, that's our, our start point, but then we want to continue in that, God. It's not like we, 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 we make ourselves poor in spirit to come to Jesus and then, and then we no longer walk in that way. No, we wanna, we've come to you. Every believer in Jesus Christ has had to have been poor in spirit initially in order to enter the kingdom. But then we want to continue to walk in that humility, to walk in that space of, as a disciple of Jesus, I need him. God, I need you and I want to acknowledge my need for you. I don't have it all together. I'm not as great as I think I am. God, I need you. And if that's our heart, here's the promise. The kingdom's yours. Yours is the kingdom of heaven. A kingdom that will never perish. A kingdom that will last forever. And so Lord, help us to be poor in spirit. The second thing we ask, Lord, is that you would help us to mourn. First and foremost, that you would help us to mourn our sin. That we would be grieved by the wrong things that we do and say. But, but in our grief, we would then turn in faith to you, Jesus, and experience the comfort of the gospel. That no matter the depth of our sin, the depth of God's mercy is greater. And so, Lord, help us to be, to be those who mourn our sin. And likewise, Lord, we've also acknowledged that irrespective of mourning our sin, even just living in a fallen and broken world, there are going to be times where, where we, we go through grief, where we go through mourning. And in those moments, we pray that we would realize that as disciples of Jesus, we have hope. We have hope in being comforted by you right now, God. We have hope in as you comfort us, you use us to comfort others. But we have this hope that there is ultimate comfort to come because we're part of the kingdom. And so, Lord Jesus, I pray that that would give us great encouragement and help as we go throughout this week. Help us to be poor in spirit. Help us to mourn and experience your comfort because this is the path of the blessed life, the life of the disciple of Jesus. Amen.